Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, episode 24, a successor to Mercury. On this week's episode, we will begin our look at the Apollo program. For most of my listeners, I probably don't need to explain why I'm so, so, so excited to be talking about Apollo, but let's not take anything for granted. The Apollo program is the moment humanity left the cradle. The moment when for the first time we left our home behind and explored new worlds. The moment when we proved definitively that we would be a spacefaring species. The moment when we began our journey to the stars. The Apollo program has everything you look for in an epic story. A dramatic call to action by a charismatic leader. A race against a shadowy adversary. Triumphs tragedies, and a coming together of an entire nation to accomplish something great. The legend of Apollo is well known, and with good reason. But what I hope to do in the coming months is part the veil and show that the concrete reality of humanity's journey to the moon is just as rich, just as inspirational, and just as worthy as telling as the lore. It is at this point that I also feel the need to do something that every bit of podcasting advice says not to do and that is to inject a little doubt. I've mentioned it before, but I feel that it is important to remind you that I am not a historian. And while I definitely know quite a bit about space at this point, one of my primary motivations for this show is to learn more myself. I'm going to be doing my best to present both accurate information and connect it all to the larger context, but with only so much time for research and writing, there are sure to be some slip-ups. I'd also like to remind you that corrections are always welcome. And actually, speaking of corrections, I have one small error to set straight. In a previous episode, I mentioned how the Mercury and Agena launched from Launch Complex 14. And that was true, but I also said that the pad was now being used by SpaceX for their Falcon 9 landings. It turns out that Landing Zone 1, as SpaceX has renamed it, was actually Launch Complex 13, just next door. Can't win them all, I guess. So with all that said, if you're still on board, I'm still on board. Let's get to it. The origins of Apollo are probably one of the most misunderstood parts of the program. Most people would tell you that the Apollo program was started by President Kennedy in 1961 in order to achieve the goal, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and safely returning him to the Earth. That's pretty close, but it misses an important nuance. The lunar landing was not Apollo, and Apollo was not the lunar landing. They came to be so intertwined as to become indistinguishable, but they didn't start that way. Way in the early days of the space race, just as NASA was first getting started and Project Mercury was still being bolted together, a next-generation spacecraft was already in the works. One of the things that surprised me most when doing research for this podcast is just how early design and development for a spacecraft has to start. Even though Mercury hadn't even been built yet, let alone flown, Engineers knew that if they wanted an advanced spacecraft to be ready to fly next, they needed to start right away. One big question was what the goals of such a follow-on spacecraft would be. This is a tricky question when you haven't even flown your first spacecraft yet. This called for some committees and studies. In April 1959, engineers from NASA centers across the country got together to form the Research Steering Committee for Manned Spaceflight. Since that's quite a mouthful, it's usually known as the Get Committee, after the guy running it, Harry Get. I have no idea how to pronounce Mr. Get's last name, but that's what I'm going with. It's spelled G-O-E-T-T if you want to take a shot at it. Harry Get was an engineering manager at the Ames Research Center, and later in 1959 became the first director of the newly formed Goddard Space Flight Center. Hey, that's where I work now. The committee's task was to take a look at the current state of the art and at what could be possible in a next-generation spacecraft. Rather than simply improving on Mercury and creating a sort of Mercury 2.0, which is where Gemini eventually comes from, the GET committee was thinking big. They saw this next vehicle as the, quote, preliminary step to development of spacecraft for manned interplanetary exploration. They wanted a vehicle that would be versatile enough to handle several different types of missions, especially since no one had any idea what types of missions they would be doing. In 
Some of the mission types being talked about, even this early on, were space stations in Earth orbit, space stations in lunar orbit, reconnaissance flights around the moon, and perhaps even a landing. None of this was all that crazy. When you looked at the landscape of booster development and assumed the usual series of technological improvements on the spacecraft, all sorts of missions quickly became possible. But there was a serious chance that none of the ideas of the GET Committee would ever come to fruition. All of this was happening during the last few years of President Eisenhower's administration, and he had a very different view on the space program than his successor. Eisenhower's ideal NASA was small, quiet, and cheap. He begrudgingly went along with Project Mercury, since thanks to the Soviets he didn't really have an alternative. But in his mind, this was a one-time thing. I found an interesting quote from one of Eisenhower's advisors around this time that illustrates his line of thinking. James Killian said, quote, Unless decisions result in containing our development of man and space programs and the big rocket boosters, we will soon have committed ourselves to a multi-billion dollar space program. I guess he wasn't wrong. Eisenhower was so concerned that later on he nearly included a line in his State of the Union speech that would have promised to end the manned spaceflight program after the first successful orbital launch. So you can imagine his dismay when he realized that a bunch of space nerds on some committee were talking about something as crazy as landing on the moon. A bureaucratic scuffle ensued, with Eisenhower trying to exert more direct control over NASA. Thankfully, then-Senator Lyndon Johnson intervened, and NASA's post-Mercury plans survived. The GET Committee wasn't the last to examine the future of spaceflight. In 1960, the Space Task Group, the predecessor to the Manned Spacecraft Center, began to examine the problem a little more concretely. They came to the conclusion that the Mercury successor should carry a three-man crew, be capable of operating in Earth orbit, as well as on circumlunar flights, be able to support 14-day flights, and be ready to fly in 1966. This is all starting to sound pretty familiar. With such a vehicle, NASA would have access to lots of different types of missions and wouldn't have to lock down their options early. If you're wondering how they arrived at a three-person crew and not some other number, it wasn't arbitrary. With three people, you could split them into specialized roles. One would monitor the spacecraft itself, its environmental control system, the communications, power, and so on. Another would handle guidance and navigation, making sure the vehicle went where it was supposed to. And the third would be a commander, who would pilot the vehicle as well as be the source of authority. The three-man spacecraft would be known as Apollo, the suggested name coming from NASA manager Abe Silverstein. Silverstein envisioned the Greek god Apollo flying his chariot across the sky, and we got something just about as incredible. In July of 1960, it was time to reveal Apollo to the world. NASA asked aerospace companies to bid on feasibility studies for the program. These would flesh out more detail and hopefully both find new possibilities while also striking down any potential issues. Among other suggestions, one common theme to emerge from this study was similar to the idea of splitting the crew into three specialties. With Mercury, you just had one spacecraft that did everything for the whole mission. With Apollo, the suggestion was to break it into specialized modules. First, a command module. This would be the main control area and would house stuff like communications, guidance, and navigation equipment. It would also be where the crew spent the majority of their time and what the crew would use to return home. Next would be a propulsion module. You only needed propulsion while still in space, so there was no need to bring it back home. By putting the propulsion and other utilities in a separate module, they could make it disposable, which made it lighter and cheaper. And thirdly, a mission module. This wasn't any specific piece of hardware, but rather the concept of a dedicated module for the particulars of each mission. So for instance, if Gemini 7 had had a mission module, it may have just been a little more room for the astronauts to stretch their legs and have some privacy, or extra equipment for science experiments. A big difference between the findings of the industry studies and the GET committee was that industry did not envision a lunar landing as part of Apollo. They figured that would come as a natural next step for a spacecraft to come afterwards. After all, there was no rush. Dot, dot, dot. 
Fast forward to May 1961, and things are different. President Eisenhower is off playing golf somewhere, a new and energetic President Kennedy is in charge, and the Soviet Union is making the world wonder if communism is going to beat capitalism after all. The world is looking at spaceflight and using it as a shortcut to determine the capability of both countries. If a country is able to orbit a human and safely recover them, it says a lot about the state of their industry, technology, resources, and so on. Kennedy himself was not actually a huge fan of expanding the space program, preferring to spend the money on other programs. But he realized that if spaceflight is going to be a barometer of progress, then we needed to get ahead of the Russians. He met with the NASA leadership and asked for a spaceflight goal where we could beat the Russians. It would need to be something clear and unambiguous, as well as suitably far away that Russia's early lead could be minimized. Thankfully for all us spaceflight fans, NASA looked at what they had on the books and said they were already planning on flying Apollo to the moon and perhaps even landing on it sometime in the 1970s. Kennedy asked if it could be done by the end of the decade. With the right resources, it seemed doable. A lunar landing was a perfect goal to meet Kennedy's objective. It was far enough away that we would have time to catch up and to pass the Russians. It was clear-cut and easy to understand. Land astronauts on the moon and bring them back by the end of the decade. And while I'm not sure how much it played into the actual decision-making, I have to imagine that the dramatic and epic nature of the journey was a positive as well. Space stations are incredible achievements, but everyone who witnessed the moon landing live remembers exactly where they were at that moment. Do you remember where you were when the first component of the ISS was launched? For most of us, probably not. But there's an important thing to keep in mind with the decision to fly to the moon. I love the main narrative as much as the next guy, but the reality is a little more, if you'll pardon the expression, down to earth. Was Kennedy a visionary who wanted to propel us into an age of interplanetary travel? Not really. He was a politician who saw a good opportunity to advance the interests of our nation abroad. Is Kennedy's decision the only reason we landed on the moon? Probably not. It seems pretty clear from my research that if NASA could keep their budget at reasonable levels, they likely would have pulled off a landing anyway, but in the mid to late 70s. But does this more pragmatic origin story detract from the inspiration and awe of the Apollo program? I really don't think so. If anything, I think it adds some interesting texture to the already intricate tapestry that is the history of human spaceflight. Regardless of his motivations, we have President Kennedy and his inspirational call to action to thank for all that's about to follow. With NASA's commitment clear, it was time to figure out how to do it. Before anyone could really get going on the hardware, the question of mode needed to be settled. In short, how, literally how, are we going to fly to the moon? There were three main contenders for this. Direct ascent, Earth orbit rendezvous, and lunar orbit rendezvous. The most straightforward, and the clear favorite at the start, was direct ascent. This mode definitely takes the win for simplicity. The plan for direct ascent was to build a ridiculously huge rocket, launch it directly towards the moon, turn it around, and land gently on the surface. Once there, get out, plant a flag, get back in, and fly directly back to the Earth. No lunar orbit involved. Not even any Earth orbit involved and only one giant spacecraft to deal with. I like direct ascent because, and there's no way to say this without sounding insulting, it sounds like how every little kid who ever thought about going to the moon imagined it would work. Launch, land, launch, splash, done. But once you started running the numbers, the issue with direct ascent became apparent. If you think the rockets they actually used were big, you should see what would have been necessary for direct ascent. So right away you need bigger facilities, bigger launch pads, and more expensive hardware. But then you get to the moon and things are still big. With only one vehicle, you're forced to bring the rocket you'll use to get back to the Earth all the way down to the lunar surface. This is not only inefficient, why well, carry that fuel all the way down and back up again, but results in a really big rocket to somehow land on the uneven lunar surface. <laughs> 
So yeah, if you had an unlimited budget and weren't in a big rush, Direct Ascent could be done and would likely keep things simple, at least on paper. But it wasn't pragmatic for achieving Kennedy's goal. Next was Earth Orbit Rendezvous. When it became clear that Direct Ascent was going to prove impractical, EOR became the next favorite. The idea here would be to launch the moon ship one piece at a time on multiple rockets, and then assemble them in Earth orbit. And when I say multiple, I mean it. Some of these plants called for over a dozen launches per mission. This method was more complicated, especially if dozens of launches were required, but would allow NASA to get by with smaller rockets. It also meant that they could still land on the moon in one big vehicle, which seemed a lot safer than the next mode we'll get to. Earth Orbit Rendezvous wasn't a bad idea, and it's probably how we'll get to Mars someday, but it added a lot of operational complexity and would require even more new technology to be developed. At this point, no one knew how to rendezvous at all, let alone build a spaceship in space once you did. And now we come to the underdog that won the day, Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. LOR was a solution to the problem of landing on the surface of the moon with the rocket you planned to use to get home. Rather than land the whole thing at once, the plan would be to leave the ride home in lunar orbit and then descend to the surface in a specialized lander. When the time came to go home, the lander would return from the surface and rendezvous in lunar orbit with the main vehicle. From there, they could ditch the lander and head back to Earth. Another benefit of LOR was that it looked like it could all be launched on a single Saturn C5 rocket then in development. One launch, minimal on-orbit assembly, cheaper and faster. Sounded pretty good, but it was not at all popular. The issue was that if the rendezvous in lunar orbit failed, that was it. There was no backup plan. If something went wrong during an Earth orbit rendezvous, they could just punch the retro rocket button and come home, as Neil Armstrong and David Scott can attest. But if something went wrong in lunar orbit, the guys in the lander would be doomed to remain in lunar orbit forever. This would not only be a grim ending for some heroic astronauts, but it also had the potential to taint the entire program. Imagine looking at the moon today, decades later, and knowing that their bodies were still flying around it every couple of hours. It's not nice. It took a lot of advocacy from some pretty passionate people, insert mandatory John Hubble reference here, and some open minds from the NASA leadership for LOR to take the lead as the preferred mode. It also put a lot of pressure on Project Gemini to prove that rendezvous could not only be accomplished, but could be reliably depended on. The choice of mode could easily fill an entire episode on its own, but I wanted to make sure we touched on it early, because that single decision would shape everything we're about to spend a year or so talking about. It impacted booster design, spacecraft design, lander design, the operational plans, everything. But there's one other mode that gets an honorary mention for just being super crazy, and that's Lunar Surface Rendezvous. There are two ways of thinking of this. One was not so crazy, and one was super crazy. The not so crazy version was that we would land supplies, fuel, and a return ship on the surface ahead of time. This way, when people arrived, they could just land right next to their ride home and be good to go. But if they, or any of their supply shipments, landed a few miles downrange, well, game over. The super crazy one was to land an astronaut on the surface as soon as possible and then just keep sending him food and air till we could figure out how to get him back. Any volunteers? So the goal was set and the mode decided. The time for feasibility studies and long incremental ramp-ups was over. The time to start issuing contracts for hardware, bending metal, and pouring concrete was beginning. If we were going to go from a 15-minute suborbital flight to boot prints on the moon in less than nine years, we needed to get to work. NASA needed new operation centers, new training facilities, new tracking networks, new launch pads, new everything. Next time, we'll be learning about one of the more overlooked elements of NASA at this time, infrastructure. <laughs>
at Astra. Catch you on the next pass.